Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. I've literally just come back from the dentist and half of my mouth doesn't work right now. Uh, my tongue is numb. So uh, why I decided to do, <coughs> record this after the dentist as opposed to doing it before the dentist is a question that I'll never know. But anyway, I'll uh, persevere here. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from what, within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, take action, give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, uh, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Uh, Social Democratic is also presented to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you passionate about providing access to justice? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, is looking for a senior associate to join their TAC and work injuries team on a full-time permanent basis in Dandenong and Ringwood. You'll use your legal technical knowledge and expertise to strive for fair outcomes for their clients. The role is based obviously in Melbourne. And to apply, go to morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic. That's the bit that's hard to say, socially, socially democratic. Your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And abroad we go again today. We're going to talk to Janae Wartell. You may may remember we spoke to Janae after the uh, Senate runoff elections in January 2021, earlier this year, which now feels like a decade ago. Well, we're going to get Janae back on again because we're going to talk about the legacy of Barack Obama. Janae herself was a field organiser in 2008 and a regional field director in 2012 for the Obama campaign. And there's been a documentary that was released earlier in the year on HBO, I am assuming it's on Binge here in Australia, titled Obama in the Pursuit of a More Perfect Union. You should check it out. It's a three-part documentary film. I think each episode goes for about an hour, an hour and a half. So it's pretty extensive. And it covers uh, his personal and political journey from childhood, college, moving to uh, Chai Town and then running for um, office uh, and then becoming a senator and then the White House. Uh, the other thing that made me want to think about and do a podcast on the legacy of Barack Obama is today is um, I went to a, 13 years ago today, I and a group of mates uh, went and attended our very first Obama uh, rally when we were over there in 2008 for the campaign. Anyway, it made me think about the Obama legacy that he's left particularly in campaigning but also i wanted to have a chat to janae about race um and um how complex the issue was for both obama and for the people of america and for the people who had high high expectations of his presidency uh with um dealing with the matter of race and racism and institutional racism in the united states anyway looking forward to having a chat to janae uh, about that today don't forget to if you like the show uh, follow us or subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify and Stitcher. And if you like the show, let us know by leaving us a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And for all the latest updates about the show, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Thursday morning in uh, free Melbourne. We're coming to the end of our very first week of freedom and I've only been outside twice. Um, But uh, we are heading overseas for today's episode. We're joined on the line for the second time. Uh, She's a Democratic consultant based in Washington, D.C. Janae Wartell, welcome back to Socially Democratic. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Now, the last time we spoke, I think it was just after the Georgia runoffs. It was. It was about a week or so, maybe two weeks after. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a a wild year. (laughs) It has been. I know it has been a wild year. Um, We're going to do a, um, in December for the podcast, we always do like a wrap uh, of, uh, you know, politics, but we've decided to break it up into a wrap of Australian politics and then a wrap of international politics because there's just too much happening and we can't do all of it in the one show. It's been insane what's been going on in the United States at the moment. Right, yeah. Um, Now... The reason why I wanted to get you on the show today is uh, I wanted to t- speak to someone uh, to talk about the legacy of Barack Obama. And the reason why I wanted to do that is two reasons. Uh, there was a documentary that was on HBO 
in the middle of the year, which was quite an extensive documentary. It was like a three-part series, and I reckon every episode it went for at least an hour, maybe even an hour and a half. So it was a marathon effort that covered um, his personal and political journey from childhood all the way through to the White House. Um, and it just made me sort of ref- reflect on the Obama administration and, and the things that Obama achieved, particularly now that we've come through this nightmare of the, the presidents that followed him. The other thing that reminded me of it was uh, today is the uh, the anniversary of, uh, which is more of a personal thing, uh, 13 years ago today I t- attended a, an Obama rally at JMU in Harrisonburg, Virginia with a group of friends of mine, Australian friends of mine. And that moment uh, at the at the rally and also just volunteering on the campaign in 2008 uh, gave me, uh, I guess I'll call it, a reinvigoration or rediscovery of my passion for organising. Um, I was a union organiser for eight or nine years at the time and I actually was feeling rather jaded about my work and it was only when I went over to the United States and discovered that there was a thing called electoral organising, which is something that hadn't happened in Australia, or even this word community organising that I'd never even heard of before. Um, and hearing Obama talk about it and just seeing it myself was uh, a seminal moment in my own career. So. Even I, I think in some ways Obama's legacy has even impacted on my journey, which is incredible given that I live on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So thinking on that, I thought I just want to sit down with someone and have a bit of a yak about Barack Obama and the legacy that he's left. So you are it, Janae. I'm dragging you into this conversation today to do that with me. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, excellent. Now where I really want to lean in at the start particularly is uh, campaigning and I mean, that's the first thing that kind of all got our attention was the Obama campaign, certainly for social Democrats around the world and people in the US. And a majority of my US political friends and colleagues that are involved in democratic politics today um, all attribute their entry point into uh, campaigning through the Obama campaign. Not Hillary Clinton, not John Kerry, not Bernie Sanders, not Joe Biden, but Obama. Uh, And I think you're included in that group as well. your first start into politics. Talk us about. Talk us through. Um, you're an you're an FO in 2008. It's, give give paint the scene. Why did you get? How did you get drawn into this into into Obama world? Well, yes, I, I would say I was kind of on that that bandwagon um, of people who were inspired to get involved um, because of the Obama campaign. You know, I was a college senior in 2008, so I'm, I'm dating myself. And um, initially I had some aspirations to go into law, um, but really it was because I was interested in how we shaped our notion of what America could be, what America should be, fairness, justice, equality, all of those things from a values perspective really resonated with me. It was one of the reasons why I thought that the legal profession was was the avenue that I wanted to pursue. But I got involved with registering voters and talking to folks about the 2008 election in my senior year. And so it was then that I decided to put off going to law school graduated that summer with the intention of helping the Obama campaign. Well, you know, the job didn't land immediately because the, the, the campaign was still staffing up. So I had to wait for about two months. And finally, I get a call that said that they needed organizers in Missouri. And much to the sheer, uh, I don't want to say disappointment, but certainly the, the fear of my, my parents, um, just packed up my car with my sister and drove halfway across the country to Missouri from Georgia. And it sounds crazy to anyone, and it is a little crazy, but I think I was so inspired by having seen the president, um, who was then a a primary candidate just on TV, um, giving some speeches, talking to voters. And I was so inspired by the message that he was bringing. And I... Once I first got interested in, in following the president and really supporting the president, um, who was then you know senator and, and candidate, was watching the 2004 uh, convention speech. And like, who could have walked away from that speech not feeling inspired about his vision for America? And so I got involved in organizing. You know, fast forward to the summer and fall of 2008, I was an organizer. It was my first full time job ever, and it really changed the course of my life, of my career pursuit. Um, that I wanted to keep organizing in community um, 
work at the center of my professional career. And so I, like many, just got involved through the campaign, but have stayed involved since in political campaigns because it was a really t- real turning point for me because it was nothing like I'd ever seen in politics, right? It took the cynicism out of politics for me to say, hey, everyday people can be a part of this process and make a difference. Um, it doesn't always have to be about high-minded politicians or complex policies. This is about people. And the president really personified that for me. He really um, embodied that um, as a candidate. And so that's how I that's how I got hooked, so to speak. A, a lot of people credit that 04 speech at the Democratic Convention as that the moment that he first came on the national national stage. What was it in the speech at that moment that drew you to him to sort of sit up and go, oh, this is this is a bit different. I mean, it was an amazing speech and obviously laden with public narrative and the story of self, us and now. And not that we knew that yeah. at the time, but what were the parts of the speech that you're listening to going, oh, this, is, this, guy's, uh, this guy's interesting? Really, it was him talking about his background, um, you know, being raised by a single mother, um, having, you know, been born in Hawaii, having um, been a community organizer. And, and his story was so unique and what was compelling for me was not just the uniqueness of the story, but that he centered his politics in a story of self. And that was the first time that I heard a politician really lead with story of self. And not that I'd watched a bunch of politicians before then, but he told the story of his values through the lens of what he had experienced. And so I thought that that was really, having been a student of political science and having gotten a political science degree, I had I, I'd never studied story of self. You know, we didn't, weren't talking about Uh, Marshall Gans, we weren't talking about the grassroots organizing model. We were talking about policy and theory and all these things that are academically connecting you to politics, but are not connecting you from a values perspective. Um, So one was telling a story. The second was this vision of America as it could and should be, right? That there there weren't really these divisions beyond what what were man-made, these divisions based on our own ignorance and lack of connecting with our neighbors and lack of coming together around values, that in fact we all had shared destiny and shared interests and shared values that once we actually came together around, we could accomplish something great. We could reform this thing called democracy. We could participate in this thing called democracy in a real way. And so that was just inspirational for me. It was inspirational for a lot of people who said, wait, this is not just about policy. This is not about policy. This is about me. This is about me shaping the world around me in a way that brings everyone to the table, that values everyone's opinions, that values everyone's lives. And so um, those two components for me, you know, were what made that speech so memorable and so compelling. And, you know, he's always saying, there's not a red state in America, there's not a blue state in America, there's the United States of America. And, you know, that was a big applause line for me. But coming from a red state in America, or what was considered a red state of America, Georgia, I was just kind of like, wow, like even living in a state like I live in and coming from a community that I come from, there's a place for me in this process. So that idea of inclusion uh, was really, really spoke to me. Why were the, the why was the 2008 and 2012 um, Obama campaign so transformational for folks that wanted to engage in that political process? Like, how did that come about? And can you get it from your experience as um, first as a, a volunteer, but then eventually as an organizer? Like, yeah. I think what was so transformational about the campaign is that it empowered everyday people in communities across the country. Um, we had this saying on the campaign, and it was respect, empower, include. And the respect piece was an understanding that some of us came from different backgrounds with different experience, with different from different families, but we all needed to respect each other's opinions. We all needed to respect each other's perspective because it was about your lived experience, right? And perhaps your your inability to connect with certain people was based on the fact you didn't know them, you didn't understand their story. So you have to start from a place of respecting people so you don't alienate them. Um, The empower piece was really that everyone had a part to play, right? The campaign wasn't about, are you the most skilled volunteer? Are you the most, you know, um, you know, extroverted person? Are you the most eloquent speaker? It was this idea that everyone, no matter how limited their skill or ability or knowledge of politics was, had a part to play. That if it was just talking to your neighbor next door about voting or making sure that they were registered, that mattered. 
every little thing mattered. And I think that was empowering for people, right? It was that culture that you felt when you walked into a campaign office, that there were people knew each other's names, people welcomed you. They created that sense of you are a part of this greater movement. And then the inclusion piece, I think, just goes to the empowerment, which is there was no one who we couldn't find a role for. You know, even if you were somebody who was afraid to get on the phones um, and talk to other voters, you know, maybe there was a role entering data, right? Maybe there was a role doing something else. And so this inclusion suggested that there is no part too small or no person too limited in their skill that they can't be a part of this work. And I think that's how the movement grew to include so many, because you had people from so many different backgrounds, opinions, skill level, experience, who all had a seat at the table in the campaign. And I think that was for a lot of people what um, was so transformational. They hadn't seen a campaign like that before. Um, and the other piece of that I think was that it really valued people's voices. Um, you know, having organizers in every community across America meant that you were listening to people, listening to voters in a way that you that we hadn't before. And as a volunteer, one of the first things they taught me was how to tell the story, my story of self, so that you could sit and connect to, to someone no matter what their background was. You could tell them, this is why I started volunteering. This is why I started uh, doing this work of registering voters and talking to voters like yourself, because this is what I believe, this is what's important to me, what's important to you. And so people were being listened to in a way that they hadn't been listened to before. And that's why they were able to open up their homes, open up their hearts, open up their minds to receive the message of change, which is really what the campaign was all about. Um, and, and, and so I would say those were really the key elements that made the campaign so transformational and has had a lasting impact on communities to this day. Um, I know volunteers who had never volunteered who are now lifelong volunteers. People who had never met their neighbors that now, every time there's a political speech on television, there's a State of the Union address, there's a, a campaign, they come together. Um, I have volunteers from 12 years ago who are still meeting to this day. Some of them have run for city council. Some of them have run for um, other municipal offices. And so that legacy has been lasting. Yeah, it's that legacy. I mean, that's the whole point, the point of the podcast isn't to talk about legacy, but it's I just it's interesting because when you listen to uh, uh, Democrat voters and activists of, of a so that the um, the boomer generation they all look to RFK as being the sort of their moment of why they engaged in democratic politics or why they engaged in uh, civic leadership or politics in general. I feel like that. Obama has become the the RFK for this, you know, the post millennial uh, period in American politics. It's just it's it, it was so transformational. And listening to you just talk about that, then, you know, we here in Australia, in, in the home state of Victoria, when we launched our own uh, electoral or grassroots organising program, you know, in 2012, 13. Um, the, the the respect and power include we sort of sat down and said right we need to come up with our own values because we don't we don't value our volunteers at this moment in time we kind of treat them like cannon fodder like just go out there and letterbox or drop you know leaflet or whatever or stand on a on a polling booth for 12 hours on a day um and we came up with we said well, we can't steal obama's because that's not original so we have to come up with our own we come up with lead connect respect and it, we said to our organizers you have to live these values every day and so they didn't forget we put the words yeah. lead, connect, respect up in all the campaign offices. It was on the back of their hoodies. It was on their T-shirts. Yes. It was on their lanyards. Yes. Like it was, yes. I was getting to the point yes. that I was going to get them to tattoo it on their arm. Like do yes. not forget yes. to show yes. leadership with everyone. Do not yes. forget to connect with people and do not forget to respect our people because if you yes. don't do that, they won't come yes. back. Um, yeah. That's exactly what we did. I mean, like we had giant banners in all of our campaign offices. I have pictures. Um that just said respect and power include and when you talk about the staff being trained in that way that was that was a a a thread through every piece of training that staff received because it was like you could be really good and really smart and and, and eloquent but if people don't see you living the values of the campaign that is why people come right they might come for obama they they're excited about him but they stay for you because they see you living and modeling those values and how you treat your volunteers how you run your offices how you build your team 
teams. And so it, it, it made all the difference. And some people hear it and they say, oh, that's corny. Like people came because they were, yeah. you know, no, people came because of the kind of campaign that we built and the kind of culture that we um, that we reinforce through our everyday work. As you're saying that as well, now I remember, sorry, I'm not even talking about Obama now, but just having to live those values, you actually have to adhere to those values as well. And I remember there was a candidate that spoke to either my, one of the volunteers or one of our organisers and absolutely read them the riot act, like just ripped them out. I wasn't there, but they told me, they said to me, oh, look, I've spoken to your, your organiser and I've, you know, I've told them, I've gave them an absolute stern talking to and yada, yada, yada. And I've just gone, and right away I've gone, that's not lead connect respect. And I said, uh, sorry, please don't do that. We don't do that anymore. That's not the way we're going to conduct ourselves because if we're going to mm-hmm. build something bigger, we have to start to treat people with respect. And sure, they've done something wrong. You can sit down and talk to them about why that was wrong, but don't just scream at them in the middle of the campaign office. <laughs> please don't do that. Yeah. No, right. And there are those volunteers that could be, you know, a little challenging either because, you know, they had been in the communities working and they saw this new infrastructure, these young people coming in and saying, you know, we've got this training manual and now we're going to teach you how to organize, right? That was the respect part as well, right? Because you had people who had been volunteers from, you know, campaigns back in the 60s, right? Who were coming to the Obama campaign who had a very strong idea and notion and guiding principles themselves on what did organizing mean. And so it didn't mean that you dismiss those folks, right? It didn't mean you shove them in the corner of their office. It didn't mean when they challenged you in front of a group of volunteers that you could just kind of you know, go off on them. You had to say, okay, the, the, this momentary, uh, uh, this moment of frustration will be, could be very bad for our team if you handle it wrong. So take deep breaths find common ground with this person and keep and keep them in this movement. And that was how we were taught to work through all of those sorts of challenges or tensions on the ground. The Obama campaign kind of made grassroots or community organizing mainstream, didn't it? How, I mean, how, how did it come from that sort of place in, oh, I won't say in the shadows, but a, a, like a sort of a, a practice that not a lot of people knew about, then all of a sudden every third person is talking about community organizing. Like how did this, how did this happen? Well, you know, some people, my mom, um, and also Sarah Palin, obvious, uh, apparently, didn't know what a community organizer was, right? And they didn't know that it was a job. Um, and they didn't know that it was something that people did for, for a living. And, you know, the Obama campaign really made having a field program or an organizing program, which is, you know, a, just a team of uh, organizers on the ground talking to voters, recruiting volunteers, it made it the norm, right? It made it that you needed to have a field program as a part of your winning strategy, right? It wasn't just TV, it wasn't just mailers, it wasn't just drive-by billboards and visibility. It was really about, are you thinking about who your voters are? Are you meeting them where they are? Are you having the conversations that are gonna help move uh, their opinion and, 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 and really earn their support? So that became, I think, much more of a norm and much more of an imperative for democratic campaigns coming out the success of the Obama campaign. Um, and, and pretty much every winning campaign since has relied very heavily on a field program, on trained professional organizers, and on a volunteer organization built from the ground up. Mm. And so I think we definitely have, at least in modern times, to credit the Obama campaign with really making that the norm and not the exception. There were... <laughs> When I've met some folks over in the US that didn't, there were there are organisers but have not come through that Obama um, world, yeah. um, they kind of roll their eyes and go, oh god, like as if like Barack Obama invented community organising, and and, you know, and I feel like and I don't, I feel, I defend, I go, well, okay, I don't think they're saying that, but no, you know, no, and the question I put back to them is, well, okay, if Howard Dean was doing it or if John Kerry was doing it then they didn't build a movement that was transformational for both the United States and also win an election. Like, why him? Why, what is that combination between Barack Obama and the work of field organising that made this so successful? Why, why did it not take under Howard Dean or, or John Kerry? I mean, is it, is it Obama? Is it because he come from a community organising background? Did he have the right ingredients? Like, what, what, what pulled, pulled all this together? 
I think it was two key, two key um, components. I think the first was that you have to think about what was happening in 2008, just in our world. What was the political landscape? What were people's political attitudes in that moment? I mean, we were in a recession. There was a war going on. And I think there were so many reasons for people to feel very anxious um, and really hopeless in a lot of ways. And I think when you talk about what Obama, when he stepped on the main stage, brought to people, I think it was a sense of hope and inspiration. Right. It was this America beyond the limitations that we saw. It was this America beyond this, you know, this sense of despair. And so when he spoke in a way that only he can speak, some people just got it. You know, some people just got it. They got it. It's a gift. When he spoke, he inspired people. And no, that didn't win elections in and of itself, but he inspired people that there was a movement that could be shaped by the people who were at the center of these challenges, of these problems, to shape their democracy in ways that brought hope to every single corner of our country. And it really put that back on people, right? It didn't just become, oh, you elect me, I'm going to do the work. It became it's your job to talk to your neighbors about the things that you care about and inspire them to turn out. So the ripple effects of that inspiration is what really powered that movement. It's what brought new people in the door. It's what brought people who had never volunteered for a campaign before in their lives to a campaign office, mm. right? Um, and without the kind of inspiration that I think Barack Obama was uniquely able to provide, that was, again, fueled by the atmospheric elements of the war, the, the, the economic um, downturn, all of those things together created this confluence of factors that I think really brought people to a moment where they said, I can agonize or I can organize. And that's a, that's a deciding moment for a lot of people. And I think so many people gratefully chose, no, I'm going to organize. Um, and so they stepped forward in a way we haven't seen before in modern history. How much can we credit Marshall Gantz for the, uh, and his work in this legacy story of community organizing and coming into the mainstream? Well, I'll say it, there's, there's in my mind a tremendous credit that's due to, to Marshall Gantz. I mean, he's the father of the community organizing model or widely regarded to be. And, you know, what that means for me is that he, he really centered values and the telling of personal story at the forefront of campaigning. That if we could connect on shared values, that I could bring you in to the work, as, it, as we call it, in a way that we can't when we're not connected by anything beyond just the candidate or the electoral goal. And that was a very, for a lot of people, even those who had been in politics for a long time prior to the Obama campaign, that was a transformative way of thinking about politics. Mm. And when you think about the work um, that, you know, that he was able to do with, you know, it, with, with kind of previous movements with farm workers, um, especially when you think about how we were able to transform, trans transfer some of those core principles into electoral work, I think that we could not have done that as well as was done for the Obama campaign without that foundation that Marshall Gans creating this community organizing model um, really provided. So I think we owe, a, we owe a tremendous debt to him and his, and his genius in creating that. It, that, that was the thing that struck me as a young union organizer walking into an, Ob uh, an Obama campaign office. I don't know where I was. I, was it, it might have been Little Rock, Arkansas, or, or I can't remember anyway, but walking in there and talking to the organizer there, the, the field organizer for OFA, and listening to what they were doing, it just struck me. I went, oh my God, they're using the same similar kind of organizing tactics that I'm using as a, in, a, in a workplace, but they're doing it in a political electoral setting and it I felt like an idiot because in Australia at that point we weren't doing that we were our volunteers were handing out how to vote cards on election day and going to chook raffles to do sort of small dollar fundraisers and that's pretty much it um, and I was like oh why I just I felt so stupid about not being able to make that connection if I can organize people in a workplace why can't I just organize them outside of that workplace uh, as well and in fact what's happened since then is that having then studied under Marshall, it's actually helped me then be a better union organizer going back into workplaces and going, well, no, maybe we should try this as well. So uh, realizing that this sort of community organizing model is adaptable to either a political setting or a community setting uh, or an industrial labor setting um, was, uh, was something that I had not considered 
um, but um, but basically it shapes the work that I do right now. Um, the one of the questions that I get a lot uh, from folks about after an election campaign is over um, and in between races, how do you keep organising when you're in government? Um, and I want to get your insights into the successes and the f- challenges that OFA had in between 08 and 12 and maybe even look at the sort of for 12 to sort of finishing the presidency. Like I know that they tried to keep using community organising tactics to support his legislative agenda. And from the outside, it looked impressive to me. Like, I mean, I think they did a lot of great work around healthcare. Um, But I want to get your insights into the successes and and challenges that you have when you try to keep organising after you've reached that mountaintop of winning the election. It's it's a challenge for, for sure. I would say that, you know, much of the enthusiasm that was harnessed about the president um, in that vic- that culminated in that victory and all the hard work that folks did, it was hard to translate that into policy because you saw people who got excited by the the work of getting the president elected, but in a lot of cases weren't as versed on the policy nuance, and so you had to kind of sustain people on momentum to just get a president's agenda passed because you helped to get him elected, and so there's a little bit of a disconnect for some people there because. The campaign itself didn't just center policy. And so some people are like, okay, now what does it mean to fight for healthcare? Mm. Okay, now what does it mean to fight for um, LGBT rights? What does it mean to fight for these other victories? And so I think that that was a, that was an educational moment for a lot of folks. And yeah, you lose some people because they're not used to being engaged in that way beyond the electoral work. And so I think that OFA, despite many successes, met that challenge of now creating a community organizing mindset that spanned beyond political and electoral work. And I think one of the ways that they were able to be successful is they had so many volunteers who had set up organizing teams and models in their communities. And so they were able to tap into some of that for success. Um, in the early days of organizing um, of, um, of organizing for action. But certainly, I think anyone who's a part of that will tell you it's hard to, to come down or to ride the wave of momentum mm-hmm. beyond you know, the time that they had. And so um, I would say that was just one of their biggest challenges was getting people to care about policy and the way that they cared about um, the Obama campaign itself. It's yeah, I mean, it's that sustainability of the, the the neighborhood team leader model, as you call it in the states. We gave it a different name here in Australia, but those 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 that core group of volunteer leaders that have stepped up and taken on, on ownership of the campaign for them to sustain that work beyond the election, and then actually start to sit down and strategize and work out well, what do we do next, what are we trying to fix next, how do we go back into our community? It's a it's yeah. it's not an easy model to sustain, particularly no. when you take the paid staffer out of that turf. Yes. Um, yes. But but the model's supposed yes. to work that way, isn't it? You're supposed to say, well, no, no, I've now yes. given you the skills. You don't need me anymore. You should be able to go. You guys can come together and actually work out and how to strategize. There must have been some successes with that. I mean, even here in Australia, we've got a couple of, I think there's probably four or five um, races where we've now got those leaders. They still keep meeting once a month and they just work out what they're going to be doing. And undoubtedly, there are still neighborhood teams that are are operating and functioning. I think we didn't see it at the scale after 2008 that we did in 2008. And so there was, and a lot of people, let's let's face it, were a little tired. They were exhausted. You know, the Obama campaign had been for a lot of new volunteers, an intensive experience that they had never experienced before. And certain people were like, why do you need to get back to like what I was doing before I was trying to get the president elected, right? And so just the time and the commitments that folks had to make that they were willing to make for a short term, it's hard to make those commitments long term, to go to your weekly team meeting, to, to give up your weekends. And so there was a lot of sacrifices. You know, I think team leaders and, and hyper-engaged volunteers um, found challenging to make over the long term that made the model that OFA you know, continued to use um, a little more challenging. That said, I felt like they did a great job harnessing and sustaining as much volunteer momentum as they could, given those circumstances. Yeah. One of the other criticisms of the Obama campaign is that the Democrats lost a lot of down ballot races, House races, uh, state governor races over the course of his presidency. Uh, I don't know. Um, so that I think the criticism is that 
or you can explain the criticism of, of that. I won't do that for you. But the other question that came in there was the the the, the issue of sharing of lists because Obama had a huge list. And the yeah. DNC wanted to get their hands on it, and Hillary did if she was going to run in 2016, and there's all that kind of back and forth. Do you want to sort of explain some of the the nuance of that criticism and and whether it's justified or not? Yeah. So being someone who worked for the Obama campaign in 08 and 12, um, and then also worked at the DNC, and then also having worked for some of the state legislative um, caucuses and races. I feel like I've been on like all sides of that conversation. <laughs> you are the perfect person um, to talk about this then. And, and, and so sometimes I feel like very conflicted to like represent that issue objectively in a way, because you kind of feel like, well, I've been on all sides of it. I mean, I think, you know, without question, we lost some legislative seats, um, under, during the Obama administration. And I'll say first that, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, you lose seats um, in a midterm when you get a president elected. You know, every study shows that you lose some seats. I think that to go back to the earlier um, conversation, the conversation we just had around momentum, it is often hard when you sustain people, when you create enthusiasm around a certain candidate and around a specific election to then translate that into 2009 and the in the interim the year immediately following and then into the year following that into the midterms so you're talking about people who had been engaged for the first time in 2008 and even voting participating volunteering who then had to get through the president's first year of uh, policy that needed to be defended and organized around and then you get to the midterm so by that time it's been two years since some of these um, volunteers have first been engaged. And so you, by the time you get to two years later, it's like the number of volunteers that you have that are actually um, organizing and um, and doing the work that it took to, to win legislative seats, um, you have a much small, you have a much smaller team, you have much smaller volunteer pool. And again, I don't think that there was enough connective tissue between the Obama campaign, what it meant to, to advocate for the policies that he represented once he got elected, and then, okay, now we have to win legislative seats in order to do that. That runway of voter education and how all of those things are connected, it that conversation wasn't happening, right? Um, I, I bet you if you ask most uh, volunteers, there were thousands of them on the Obama campaign, if they understood that those three things were connected and the ways in which they were connected, um, through electoral politics, I bet most of them would 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 potentially like not not be able to help talk about how their state legislator um, impacts you know Obama policy impacts the next presidential election. And so I think we had to you know embark on a, a level of voter education around how how the system works, how elections have consequences, not just in an, uh, a presidential election, but in every single election in between. That wasn't a conversation that we were having, I think, with enough specificity and with enough intentionality um, coming out of the Obama campaign. And so I think as a result, people didn't show up for those for the 2010 elections. And I was a, a state house campaign manager um, back then, I was working in the legislature and also for the House Caucus, which, you know, is the the, the collective group of Democrats um, in the House. And we got we got we took a shellacking um, because you just saw that complete drop off of enthusiasm and participation by the average Democratic voter because they didn't they just didn't we didn't reach them. We didn't appeal to them. We didn't compel them with why. We didn't have volunteers who are willing to turn out and knock on their doors and say, come vote for your local um, your local state legislator, your local state senator. And so I don't think it was any mystery why we then saw us losing, um, losing seats. I, I think also happening kind of at the same time was this understanding that people who came to the Obama campaign weren't necessarily connected to the party in the in the traditional way that a Democratic candidate is connected to the party. Mm. You know, Obama was always known as this, this candidate that was a breath of fresh air to progressive politics, but he didn't come from the institution, right? And so the ways that the DNC and the, and the state and the local Democratic infrastructure are generally connected, that didn't happen in the Obama campaign in that same way. And a lot of cases, folks' criticism was that we were setting up kind of these separate neighborhood teams that didn't intersect or um, build infrastructure in the same ways that traditional Democratic committees have over time. So there were certainly some tensions there that 
wore themselves out during the elect during the election. But then we saw that real disconnect in 2010 when we were trying to put those same pieces together, and it just didn't work because there wasn't that um, that connective tissue, both from the voter perspective and from the volunteer and activist perspective. So you know, it was like driving a car that drives well, and then you kind of pop the hood and you realize there's like a lot of different parts that are there that you know that that aren't actually working as they should. So. Um, perhaps the victory kind of obscured for us what were the real challenges with building democratic infrastructure long term, but I think we had to face that in the legislative um, losses in 2010 and beyond. What are the key learnings then from that whole OFA experience uh, that you know future democratic electoral organizing efforts um, have been mindful of? Because obviously it's you know been 13 years since uh, Obama first won, um, or or need to be mindful going forward. Obviously we have a democratic president again. We have midterms coming up in um, 12 months' time. Um, are, are lessons being learned from the things that worked, but also the things that are, um, that were that we didn't so much nail? Well, I, I would say um, to to that question, I, I do think that even um, even when in certain states there isn't as much democratic infrastructure for like the local party, I do think there always has to be a connector point, either either through staff or through volunteers or through other leaders who can connect the party with the candidates and the, the energy that's being generated on the ground through elections. And oftentimes those things kind of run parallel or in silos, but there's not a connector point, right? Like the Democratic candidate is running a campaign. They're not um, they're not always hiring local staff. And so that local staff is not connected to the community. So the community is not really, um, you know, engaged in the way that it should be. And I think that campaigns have learned that we can't just run campaigns completely outside of the party in most cases, right? Like we have to think about how is the short-term need to elect this this governor, this senator, this, this, um, this member of Congress, how is that connected to the long-term needs for the party infrastructure. And it's not always a perfect equation. It's not always something that we solve, but I think we're getting better about understanding the impact that well-run campaigns have on longer term party infrastructure and doing a better job of leaving behind, whether it's list or whether it's leaders or whether it's you know folks who come back and run the county party or the state party. I think we're trying to thread the needle in a way that is really important. Um, in 2022, um, my hope is that we do that because I think that we need we need everyone in the same boat, kind of rowing toward the same goal, which is defending the House and and uh, and the Senate. Um, but I do think that parties are a very parties can be a very complicated structure because it's it it, it well run local parties really require that everyone has a shared vision um, on how to get things done locally. And it's often hard to align that when you have so many different people with different experiences. So without getting into the rabbit hole of local or national party dysfunction and all those sorts of things, which I also know really well, um, I would say that there's a, there's a lot of diversity of opinion on how we build our party at the local level that sometimes makes our smaller victories um, harder to obtain. You and I first met when uh, I brought a delegation of Australians over to uh, DC in 2019, which now feels like a decade ago. Um, pre- really? It was, it was like 10 years ago. Yeah, pre-pandemic. Um, and uh, we met because you presented to the delegation about um, a, an initiative that was coming out of the DNC, which was the organising call. Um, and I think, I'm not sure, I'm sure we did talk about it when you are on the show last time, but maybe just sort of refresh the, the listeners, because that seemed like that was something that you guys were trying to change from previous, I mean, you said yourself, I had to drive all the way across from Georgia to Missouri to, to be an organiser, but what yeah. the organising call was trying to do was actually get people from those communities to step up and take on yeah. leadership roles. So talk, I mean, yeah. the successes of that, how did that go in the end? I know that we had a bloody... The election was done through um, <laughs> middle of a pandemic, but not, nonetheless, was that yeah. a success? Is that something that the party's going to look towards and say, oh, that's a good idea, we should do more of that? I think so. I hope so. 
Um, you know, just to, to give you quick top lines on organizing core, I mean, it was an idea that was born out of the fact that organizing is done best when it reflects people in the community, when we hire locally from community. And so one thing that national campaigns have often, often been um, the major criticism is that, you know, when you're trying to, to win in a particular state, you bring organizers from Massachusetts, from New York, from all these other places to work in communities that they don't know very well. And we said, instead of doing that time after time after time and having to force and, and build that bridge between local communities and people who do, don't look like them, don't represent them and have never been to that place, but for coming there for a job, let's instead train local homegrown talent people who know the community, they know the ins and outs, they speak the language, they know the people, and let's incentivize them becoming their local community organizers so that they don't have to go to other places to learn how to organize or to do so effectively. And for us, our focus was on um, people of color, particularly because they're very underrepresented as professional staffers in, in politics. And so when we partner with the, the Democratic Party, I think it was probably one of the things I'm most proud of um, in my work over the last 10 years. Um, and that's saying a lot, having been on, on two Obama campaigns. Mm. But I think that creating a legacy around organizing that brings new generations in, that trains new leaders who are ultimately going to be the most the senior level operatives of the next decade plus, I think creates a sustainability of a certain type that the Republicans and the you know the other side does really well, right? They have these young Republican leaders who then run for office, who then become the next congressman. I don't think you know building that bench of talent um, on the professional side and on the candidate side has always been a challenge for Democrats. And I think that organizing core tapped into that um, to a degree. And so I think we're beginning to crack the code on investing in leadership over time and how it's going to ultimately make us a stronger party, um, and build a stronger ecosystem. Let's turn the conversation to, uh, to, to race. Um, what, one of the, the underlying, uh, uh, discussions in the, uh, in the, the Obama documentary on HBO was race all the way through, it was threaded from, his, from Obama's childhood all the way through to the end of his presidency. And as one of millions of non-American social Democrats around the world, we all watched um, the United States elect their first black president. And perhaps naively, we assumed that this was a moment of unity between black and white America, but obviously things aren't always as simple as that. I want you to, if you can help us, to sort of unpack the complexity of this challenge that Obama had in terms of both expectations when he first got elected and then what he was able to achieve over the course of his presidency for African Americans. What do you think the expectations, starting with, what do you think the expectations were for African Americans when Obama first got elected? Yeah, well, you're right that there's tremendous complexity in that that answer and in, 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 in that question and that analysis. I think that, you know, so much, there was so much focus on Obama as the first black president that we had somehow like overcome racism in some part. Um, that if we could elect a black president, that the the promise and the hope for you know dismantling systemic racism was like was within within our reach. And I think it was it was certainly naive of us to have believed that um, because you know America and its institutions and its foundations um, have been built upon systemic racism in the U.S. And until we dismantle and address those um, systems, you know, a person being elected is not going to fix that. And so I think that the expectation certainly from, you know, white Americans was if I, you know, voted for Obama or volunteered for Obama, then like certainly, you know, I'm a lifelong ally. There's no more work to be done. I, I did the thing. Um, and then for black Americans, it was, okay, this is somebody, this is a country that can't elect a black man. And then there was a reckoning, like, what does that mean? What does that mean for the work? Does that mean the work gets easier? Does that mean it's still harder uh, to overcome systemic racism and those uh, and those barriers? And so I, I think it opened up a new set of questions um, for people on what was the future of race relations? And I think that's an important question for us to consider pondering, one, because it's not something that we're going to solve overnight and we're, and we're still grappling with, you know, 12 plus years after Obama's election, but I think the expectation from Black Americans was also that you know the president was going to represent policies that help to lift and 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 improve the the plight of Black people in America. I think that the president was able to certainly um, 
certainly develop um, policies and um, and be a, a champion for policies that improve the lives of Black Americans um, to a degree as it related to jobs, to a degree as it related to health care and the ACA. But I think that there was a lot left to be desired in terms of um, helping to make, make Black people more um, more equal or have more equal opportunity um, in in the workplace and you know in equal pay um, and, and things that um, still we're fighting for um, and so you know it is arguably that there it was arguable that there was like an unfair um, burden that was placed on our first black president to fix everything you know in one fell swoop but certainly there was there there is an argument that can be made that there was more that he could have done both himself and with the support of of a Congress that was only kind of working in his favor, you know, some of the time, but not all of the time. So um, I think in summary, I think we 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 crack this code of possibility in terms of what a progressive president, a president that's black or a president that believes in black lives and their equality can do. But I think what we realize is that that still takes us putting pressure on other levers and dismantling other systems in order for that to be a holistic um, approach to combating racism and improving race relations in America. So um, it's a fight that's ongoing, um, but I think it, it sparked new questions and brought the fight to a new frontier. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from uh, two people that I enjoy listening to and reading. Um, and I think that they kind of go to, uh, it still doesn't summarize the, the, the I guess, the, the, the width of opinion on Obama from black America. But I, I want to throw both of them at you um, and get your thoughts on it, starting with Cornell West. First of all, what do you think about Cornell West? I mean, his politics are probably too left wing for me, but I am fascinated with Cornell West. Like, you know, that sort of who would you invite around for a dinner party scenario? Cornell West would be yeah. top of my list because I could listen to that man for hours. I don't know what it's his tone or his tenor of how he speaks, but I just find it incredibly fascinating. But um, what, what, sorry, before I give you the quote, what do you think about Cornell West? I actually am intrigued. Yeah, I um, I I also, you know, coming from a dad, uh, my dad is very, is very, I would say progressive in the way that he's like almost just like he can be radical in a lot of ways. And I think that like one of the things that I listen to Cornell West with him often, um, you know, Cornell West like speaks truth to power, no matter how that makes people feel Mm -hmm. like he says the thing that needs to be said. And I think that like you have to have truth tellers in any democratic society that constantly push us and force us to question. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of disrupts that comfort for folks where they feel like they've settled into this reality where they're like, okay, this is race relations are here. It's fine. Things are good. He constantly pokes and prods at our notions of things being good and fine. Um, And so I like that he can be the constant social critic. I actually really do appreciate that because I think we need people who constantly are reminding us that we're not there, that we haven't come as far as we thought, that we shouldn't romanticize leaders who are not committed fully to our causes and championing our causes. And so um, I love to, to listen to him. I love to read anything he's written because he is truly thought provoking mm. uh, i too could listen for hours yeah okay good very good and the thing about it is like he's not like a he, you're right he does he prods and he pokes but he doesn't do it in a way that you know that person that can be sort of like the like the the, the, the downer that just boy sort of brings the mood down in a way oh, well you know well someone might say you know i i Climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It's one of the greatest experiences of my life. He goes, well, it's not the tallest mountain, though, is it? Because there is Everest. Yeah, it's not that kind of person that does that. He does it in such a way that when he prods and pokes, it's so thought provoking. But he frames it in such a positive way that you think, like, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Maybe we could be right. better. Maybe we could try anyway. Sorry, I could talk about right. Cornel West for hours. So anyway, one of his quotes uh, on Obama saying he says mainstream media and academia academia failed to highlight these painful truths linked to Obama. Instead, most well-paid pundits on TV and radio celebrated the Obama brand and most black spokespeople shamelessly defended Obama's silence and crimes in the name of racial symbolism and their own careerism. When he's talking about Obama's uh, silence and crimes, 
what is he talking about there? Where is where do where do folks look to Obama on race and go? You disappointed us here. I would say I think that there um, there were numerous conversations, especially toward the end of the Obama presidency, on reparations, on um, on civil rights, where it was widely widely believed that he didn't go far enough um, to really give black people their due, having built this country through the labor and the slave labor of our ancestors. And so I think that where we really wanted the president to go far enough in pushing policy um, as it related to giving, you know, black people what in a lot of cases was stolen from them from an economic um, inequality standpoint in terms of where we sit and stand in this country, I, I would say, as as not to be too general, that those were the times in which we felt like there could have been executive orders, there could have been you know bolder legislation that he could have pushed members to to um, to to act more decisively and more swiftly. And I think that you know the same can also be said of like had he come in you know with that level of um, boldness and and kind of level of of of, of forcefulness um, with Congress, like perhaps that might have compromised other things in the agenda, right? Perhaps that could have um, made it so that afford the Affordable Care Act um, and the work that he's done to to strengthen our um, our position as it relates to environmental protection, like perhaps those 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 policy was policies would have been compromised and we would have seen him as just the 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 president that is for few and not for all right and so i think that he likely saw value in being both and and some people said well you're the black president like you need to carry this mantle um, if not you then who and so i think that where black scholars um really have criticized him truly i don't think that criticism has come from a place of that he hasn't done anything as a president, but that there's so much more in a lot of the, these these um, these policy stances and, and these legislative agendas that he could have been more specifically for the black community because we've been so deeply underrepresented um, in the seats of power. To that point, then, um, uh, Michael Eric Dice, another person who I enjoy uh, reading, I think he puts out a book every 20 minutes. Um, it's a yeah. pr- pr- prolific. I actually wonder how he does it. Oh, and they know. always have like 70,000 words in them. Yeah. Um, I, can't, I went to a lecture. He, he, can't, he did a lecture on my campus um, right after Katrina. Um, and he has the book, uh, Come Hell or High Water, which is a really great read. And I was like, how does this man? It's just like his, his brain must be like processing thousands of words per second. <laughs> I saw him, I think he was on Bill Maher or something, and he said, how many books have you produced? He said, uh, I've been writing for 21 years and I've done 21, 20 books. So he's basically had a year off. I mean, like, I don't, that is a, that is a gift. I don't know anybody, any person, scholar or otherwise who could, who could do that. I know. And they're not, it's not like they, it's not like the first two or it's not like, it's not like Coldplay where the first two albums are great, the rest was shit. They're all good. Right. They're yeah, really good. They're all good. They're all good. And it's not like the album where like one album has like 10 tracks and the others have like 25, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like they're like they're all like EPs, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty incredible, frankly. Anyway, sorry. Um he uh to the point you said before about that sort of the the the, the challenge that Obama was in. Uh, Dyson says, "I feel like Obama wanted to be the president for all of the United States but was doomed to satisfy everyone." Um, do you think that he was always on that lose-lose situation when it came to race? Because if he was too black to the white majority, then you know he would lose that vote, and that's critical in terms of trying to get reelected. But at the same time, um, if he's you know if he's not black enough in the eyes of the people, that it, it's his base really. I mean, the you know the, the, the black vote in the Democratic Party is so critically important um, that he would then let them down as well. I just think that that's, that quote from Dyson kind of sums up the challenge that that Obama yeah. had. Yeah. I mean, I think he understood the mantle of leadership that he had being the first black president. Um, But I often have to remind people that like, you know, Obama won Iowa, like, you know, like he had a tremendous amount of white support as well. But I do think that when you identify and are known as your legacy as being the first black president, I think he recognized that there was there was there were things that folks expected him to do. I still think he did the things that he 
he, he still followed, I think, his own brand of leadership in those instances where he made the determinations of what he felt was the best policy for America, um, despite having the level of expectation by certain groups. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that was what made him certainly not everyone's favorite on every given day, but also I think what made him principled in a unique way is because as a leader, you have to look at things from a broader perspective, right? You can't be serving, you know, a, one specific group at the expense of others. And so he was often quoted as saying, like, I'm the president of the United States, right? And so when you are trying to be the leader of all people, certainly there are going to be groups who feel like your allegiance should be to them who are not going to be satisfied. And I think he ultimately had to sit with that, had to accept that and take that in stride. Um, and I think that's, there's a reason why he, we saw him staying the course despite the criticism. Yeah. And I guess that's going to be the challenge for any leader that's coming from a, yeah. a quote unquote minority group. The first woman president is going to have that same challenge because is she yes. going to be, is she, is she the president of the United States who happens to be a woman or is she the first president? Yeah. A for, yes. first woman president of the United yeah. States, right? Yes. Or, or, or yes. For people from other minority groups. So it's just going to be how to balance that in the eyes of those two um, sections, I guess. Do, um, yeah. Michael Eric Dyson also said that Obama was, he's a paradox. He is both embraced and alienated a meaning of blackness in the modern world. What, did he, what does he mean by that? Embrace and alienate me. I think that he he identifies as a black man he knows that he's a black man um he, he has never denied or rejected that but i think that when you are the leader of the free world and you are a black man i think that you sit at this apex of what people see blackness as in america in that moment that oftentimes doesn't represent the complexity and the nuance of the black American experience. And so I think for a lot of people, they saw this black president and they forgot about the day-to-day -day struggle of black Americans in this country. Um, and I think they became kind of comfortable with Obama as the black man in America, instead of understanding that his experience, his presidency still wasn't representative or um, didn't kind of cover the multitude of, 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 of challenges that black people had in this country. And so I think that there was a kind of a, a collective, I don't want to say dismissal, but certainly the plight of black America in, in the critical ways that we see it now kind of took a backseat for the moment to the celebration of, of the coming of a black president. So I have to suggest that that was perhaps what he, what he was trying to, to, um, to to allude to there we um last question i mean i could ask you so many more questions about both race and then move into sort of the other topics of um the things that he achieved but i guess i want to wrap it up by saying or asking you a question in 2008 he promised hope and change in the end did he fulfill that promise to the american people do you think yes i would say that to the degree that we needed to hope we needed to restore faith in our ability to create change, um, that democracy and it's it upholding democracy or undoing democracy is ultimately in the hands of the people. I think he restored that belief. I think so often we think that democracy is out of our hands, but he brought it back to its core, which is of the people. And whether that is for good or for worse, um, and we've seen that play out in every way, shape or form over the last year, um, especially that we are still the collective sum of the people. And I think that that fundamental idea and ideal um, was, was, was epitomized in the presidency of, of Barack Obama. So I think that hope piece that like we can always hope in a better tomorrow as long as we're willing to work for it is, is key. And I think that the, the change piece I'd say that there are, there are certain things fundamentally about our democracy that have changed because of the Obama presidency. The way that we think about elections um, has changed. I think the ability for an engaged citizenry to shape the democracy has changed. But I think there's a lot that hasn't changed yet and certainly hopefully will change at some point in our history. So I think he, he brought us to this, this, 
this place of knowing that we could change, that we were change agents, but I think that we have to remember that the rest of the work is still up to us. Um, and I think that that is, that was maybe his, his kind of lasting, the lasting impression that he left when he, when he exited office after, you know, Trump was elected. He was kind of like, listen, mm. did the, did, served, did the thing that I knew to do as the leader of, um, at, of the free world, now it is still up to you to make our country better. You know, me leaving office does not relieve anyone of that expectation or responsibility. And I think that that's why the work still still continues. It's why we're all still fighting because we realize that the work was not done when he got elected and it certainly wasn't done when he left office. And on that wonderful note, Janae, thank you so much for your time today. We do appreciate it. And uh, keep, uh, keep doing that change over in the, uh, in the U.S., <laughs> Well, I'll I'll keep at it. Thank you for the inspiration. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunstreet on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.